work uh, in Manhattan as well. And um, all the recording studios, the independent studios, uh, we, we got creamed. We just didn't have any business coming in. And uh, my, my then wife, we had just bought a house. And any of you that buy a house, you know that you don't have a lot of equity in your first eight months of owning a house. So we didn't have anything in savings. There was no money coming in. I had two children. We were facing a bankruptcy. And then, and then I find out that my marriage was failing. And my, my wife um, was actually having an affair with uh, a Christian musician friend of mine. And I started to develop a hidden addiction, an addiction that I hid from everybody. I would claim that I was cooking with alcohol and I did cook with it, but I started hiding bottles in the house. And before you know it, I started drinking a little bit more. And I didn't even want to admit that I had an addiction because I grew up with addiction. My father was an alcoholic and not present. And I thought that I, I said to myself, I would never be like my dad. I would never fall into addiction. But what did I do? I ended up falling into addiction, but it was so hidden. I didn't even want to admit it to myself. Hey, Arthur, can you mute, brother? Yeah. Thanks, brother. Um, so this hidden addiction, thank you, Arthur. This hidden addiction um, led to some really bad decisions in my life, led to a lot of bad decisions. And then I had a car accident. I had head trauma. I had depression. So between 9-11, bankruptcy, failing marriage, addiction starting, car accident, head trauma, depression, and some of these bad decisions that fell in with all within like a four to six month period, it became an issue uh, for me. And I found myself in prison. And I actually found myself on the most violent prison in the state of New York. There was a violent da violence daily and I had the highest suicide rate. And I didn't know what to do with myself. And um, just to give you an idea of, of, of how violent this particular prison was, we would go to yard and um, there were two fences around the yard. And it's like a, about a soccer field size uh, grassy yard uh, that we went to every other night. The rest of the yard time was always behind a wall inside of a cement area. And around the yard were these guard towers. And what the gangs would typically do is they would, they would split up if they were going to get into a fight. And they would get into fight in multiple locations in order to throw off um, them breaking up a fight. So what the guard towers would do, they would shoot a warning shot. And everyone knew that once that warning shot was fired up in the air, we had to hit the ground and hit the grass. If we didn't, the first person that popped up, they would be shot. And they weren't rubber bullets, they were real bullets. Um, so I had um, bullets whizzing over my head. It felt like a war zone. And I, I, it, was, it was absolutely crazy for, for the life that I had to where I ended up. And I had a real challenge in my faith as to where I was walking with God at that point. And um, I, I let my hair grow mainly because I didn't trust jailhouse barbers. That was my hair back at uh, Kuxaki Correctional Facility. <laughs> but uh, a lot of things happened uh, during that time. And, and I started to recognize um, things that God wanted me to change. There was a real deep cutting away of stuff that was keeping me away from God during this time. And I, I, one of the things I recognized that addiction wasn't the substance, it was a way of thinking. Addiction is a way of thinking. Just to stop drinking or drugging for anybody, that doesn't mean that they're sober. The way that you think is the roots of where addiction comes from. So I started to work on washing my brain. <laughs> And letting God come in and start to change the way that I thought so that I had the mind of Christ. The 12-step program, if Jesus is your higher power, it works. Because the power of Christ can change that, can deliver you from any addiction. And you can fill addiction with anything. If you don't believe me, try living without your cell phone for a few hours. <laughs> Just put it down and don't touch it. If it dings, if it rings, don't touch it. It's hard to do. We're so addicted to these little things. Um, but I worked at my faith and uh, I, I faced a lot of issues. One of the rules in prison at that time for officers is if they um, got assaulted or got into an altercation with an inmate, they would automatically get six months off with pay to save, to save them or protect them from retaliation by inmates. And this one particular officer um, 
he really, we all knew he really wanted six months off. He was always trying to provoke an inmate to lay hands on him. And uh, he opened up one guy's gate at one point and uh, started using a lot of racial terms and uh, said, come on out, come on out and hit me. He actually took some of his property and threw it uh, on, the, on the floor up in the hallway and jumped up and down and destroyed some of his property so that he would do that. But because he knew what he was trying to do, what the inmate knew what he was trying to do, he did not come out, did not assault him. That night, there was a conversation on the block about what, what the group was going to do about it. And everyone said that the next morning we weren't going to go to chow. Meals were mandatory at that time. And I got on the gate and I suggested to the guys that they write a ticket. Because if there's a paper trail, then there's something for the state to follow when they investigate it. If there's no paper trail, then they would just try to bury it so that their jail wouldn't be looked at by the investigators. So the next morning comes in, the gates open, I step out, I look down the hallway, nobody stepped out. I had a choice. I could go to chow and the mandatory chow, I wouldn't be violating any of the rules of the prison or I could step back in and protect my life because I would be perceived as somebody that didn't stand with what they called the green because we all wore green in prison uh, in New York. And uh, I, I ended up stepping in because I felt it was the safest decision for me to make. And because I said the night before that people should write tickets, one of the inmates on that block uh, told the lieutenant that, and all of a sudden I became a ringleader for this. And uh, even though I wasn't, I had no intention of doing what they suggested um, by, by not going to chow. So I found myself in what they call the box. What is the box? The box is a jail within jail. The box is where you're isolated. You have no communication with the outside world except letters. You can't make any phone calls. Your personal property is taken away from you. You have no human contact. The block is kept silent, so you cannot talk to anybody. You are by yourself. And for uh, three times a week, eight, you get an eight-minute shower. And it didn't matter how hot it was. You only got eight-minute showers. And you're in a very, very small, essentially a closet uh, of a space. And you get outside once a day for about 45 to 50 minutes in a cage by yourself. You are isolated. You can't get much more isolated than that. And at that point in time, I, up until then, I actually started working for the chaplain in the prison. And I started rebuilding my faith. And I couldn't understand why I ended up in this jail within a jail, why I ended up in this space. So I wrote to the chaplain, uh, and I, chaplain was one of the only people in the jail that actually could visit the box. And uh, he came up, I asked him if he would bring me communion. And he did. He came up, we prayed through the little tiny window that we had on that solid steel door. He opened up the feeding slot because we were actually fed inside the cell. He opened up the feeding slot, and he handed me communion and he left. And there I was sitting there with communion in my hand. And what I realized at that point was here I am in the most isolated place I could possibly be. And yet, in a very tangible way, Jesus was present with me in that cell. He touched me. You know, the Greek word in, 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 uh, when Jesus says, do this and remember it to me is emanesis. It means to remember something in the past in a way that it becomes really present to us in such a way that its power is the same as when it first occurred. And there was a power in that. I'm not talking about transubstantiation or anything fancy like that. I'm just saying in a very tangible, touching way. Jesus was present with me in a jail within jail in the most isolated place I could possibly be. It was profound. And all because one man said, yes, I'll be a jail chaplain. And he had been a jail chaplain for 22 years. And here he was bringing communion to me. And Jesus was able to be present the prisoners, they can't necessarily go to the church, so the church has to go to them. And this minister said yes to that call. And because of that, Jesus was present. So I cried for a good long time, dry heaves. And after a while, I walked over to the window. And at the windowsill, I noticed all these little cigarette butts that were sitting in the windowsill. 
And I imagine that there were a lot of guys in that cell before I was. And that they probably stood at that same window, looking up at the small sliver of sky they could see beyond the cement walls and talk to God because there was no one else to talk to. I'll tell you, in that space, God has your attention. And I imagine these guys probably talked to God about regrets in their life, and things they had done, and reflecting about had they made different choices. So I started praying over those cigarette butts. I said, Lord, the guy that smoked that cigarette, I pray, God, that you heard his prayer and you keep knocking on his door. And I started praying and praying until I got through 20 or 30 cigarette butts that were in that little windowsill. Then something started to happen in me. I pulled out some sheets of paper. I started writing down names of people that I needed to pray for, that needed prayer. And I turned those 30 days in isolation into a, a giant prayer meeting. It was like a retreat. And I'll tell you guys, if you haven't ever fasted and prayed, I didn't fast for the 30 days, but I did do some fasting. But I prayed straight for those 30 days, almost all day long. It's incredible. I came out of there walking on a cloud. Most guys come out of there really depressed. I came out there with a big smile on my face. They wanted to know what was wrong with me. It's because I had an encounter with Christ that was so real and life-changing. And it was then that I understood that mercy trumps justice. If you leave with anything tonight, mercy trumps justice. So things started to change in me after that. I got very, very involved. Um, and um, because I was in the box, they were slated to send me across the state eight hours away and I'd never see my children. I did have two children and I did get divorced in that prison. And, um, but I had my visitation preserved, but they would never have been able to come see me if they sent me to the Canadian border on, on the Toronto side, would never happen. I really wanted to go to an honor jail, uh, which, which was a, another jail in, in New York, which was specialized in substance abuse treatment. It was sort of the flagship prison for substance abuse. And um, I won't go into that story because of time tonight. I condensed the, the testimony so that I could share with you the most potent parts of the testimony and the, pe the pieces that I think would be relevant. But I do want to give you a look on the inside. And I ended up miraculously going to that prison. I won't even tell you how all that happened. It's too long a story, but I ended up at that honor jail. And it was amazing because after a week of being there, I saw a sheet of paper in the dorm because now I'm in a medium facility. I'm in a dorm and I see a sheet of paper inviting inmates to come to the chapel for an organ concert. I said, there's an organ here in the prison. And this organ had been restored by a foundation nearby. So I went in and I heard this pipe organ concert inside prison. It was absolutely incredible. It was wonderful. And after the concert, I heard the superintendent and the organist talking to each other. And the organist said to him, it's a shame you don't have anybody to play this because you restored this, but no one's gonna play it. And of course I looked at it as an opportunity. So I walked right up to the superintendent and him and said to the superintendent, if you get someone in to teach me, I'll play it. And I, entered, I let them know that I had a degree in music. I never learned organ, um, but I really would love to learn it and I'll make sure that it gets played. And the superintendent looked at the organist and he said, I'd be willing to come in and teach him. And the superintendent looked at me and he says, we'll make it happen. And for eight months, every two weeks, I got a private lesson on pipe organ in the prison. And I got a chance to play it at church services and uh, both Protestant and Catholic services. And the rabbi found out that I played it. And the rabbi asked me um, to play for some of his services. So I said, okay, God, you're opening up a door for me. And eventually he asked me to write some music for his congregation. Now, of course, I write music. Uh, that's what I went to school for. And the day that I was released from this jail, he called me into his office, actually the day before, he called me into his office and he said, you know, the last Seder that we did, that song, Kadosh, 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 that you wrote, he taught me a lot of Hebrew phrases. He taught me a lot about my own faith. That, that Kadosh, 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 he said, I felt like I was Isaiah in the throne room of God. And I said, well, Rabbi, you know what I'm going to tell you. I said, that's the Holy Spirit. 
I get a chance to witness to this guy about the Messiah Jesus. He helped me understand a lot of things about my faith. And I also helped him understand stuff about mine. I'll show you a little clip because this was actually aired by PBS many years ago. It's an upkeep on the instrument. And it just seemed like a perfect fit for the kind of things that we were gonna do because we were never gonna be a big money uh, fund. Uh, gave us everything that we needed, plus it, it allowed us to keep control over the money. The investment Gordon Boyd and his friends made through the Community Foundation is paying dividends they never imagined. One inmate started taking lessons, and now others have taken an interest in music. Music, to me, is therapy. Music is a very therapeutic thing for any inmate to do. It, it enables them to connect with what goes on inside of them. It helps them to find a productive way of releasing inner emotions and tension. And um, It gives them something to do with their mind. Doing something positive is only going to help the community, and it's going to help us be able to reintegrate into society. Like all so, of course, I, um, you know, talked a lot about God in the 45 minutes they interviewed me. They took all that stuff out and they just picked what they wanted to air on TV. <laughs> so that was all I could show you. But at least it gives you an idea of where the pipe organ was and, and what I did. Um, and of course, I played piano. I got a Christian choir together. I brought um, uh, people of color and Latinos and uh, whites all together to sing uh, for Christ. And it helped in so many ways, because even the churches guys was segregated. You had blacks sitting by themselves, Latinos sitting by themselves and white sitting by themselves. And it drove me nuts because that's not what Pentecost is about. Pentecost is about bringing everybody together. So I wrote a ton of music uh, for that group too. And uh, I, I looked for ways that I could witness to people. I looked for ways that I could be creative in the way that I shared with people. This picture that I have up here, you probably have seen on little tracks. But one of the things that I did is I, I actually paid guys uh, to be able to do artwork for me. And I gave this guy a little, little picture of it. And I said, can you paint this? So he took a t-shirt and he painted it. And I sent it home to my parents. This is actually sitting up on their wall in their living room. And it was amazing because when he came back to me, he said, it was really amazing for me to be able to paint this because I had to grab those images of Jesus' hand clutching this man and the passion in that and the blood underneath his feet and the hammer and the nail. And then he said to me, he said, I kind of felt like that guy was me. And I'm like, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. That was the point, finding a creative way of sharing the gospel. There was also a guy across the hall from me. He was a, a, a five, what we called a five percenter. And uh, he was sort of the leader of the, the followers of Louis, Louis Farrakhan. They called him the minister. And uh, he was a Muslim. And he was proselytizing uh, to all the, at least people that self-identified as Christian on the block. And um, I, I felt like I had to say something. So I said, okay, God, what am I going to do? So I get up and I just start asking him questions. And over the course of time, no matter what was going on in that block with 48 guys in cells talking about trash, when he and I started to talk, everyone shut up. You could hear a pin drop because these discussions, they really wanted to know what was going on. They were paying attention. And he was talking about the Bible and I was asking questions about the Quran. And finally he gave me a Quran to read and I gave him a Bible to read. And we started talking and I asked him lots of questions. I won't go into all those details again because, because of time tonight. But over that period of time, when I left that block, he said to me, he says, you are more Muslim than any of my brothers on this block. I said, what do you mean? He says, you have a seriousness about being submitted to God. He says, I find you so committed to your faith that I can consider you a brother. I said, thank you. Because Muslims consider themselves children of Abraham as well. The two children of, of, of Abraham, right? Isaac and Ishmael. Ishmael founded the Arab nations. And Islam kind of came out of that line. Um, so finding creative ways to witness. Also, one of the things that I did was I, I created um, like a, a supper night where I would cook crazy meals out of nothing because at this particular honor jail, we actually had a little kitchenette that we could cook with. But if guys were going to eat with me, what I said to them was that they had to let me pray before we ate. So we would sit at the same table and or in my usually in my room and with bowls. But they had to listen to me pray. And I always made sure I prayed for every single man there. Didn't matter where they came from, what crime they committed. Didn't matter. I had murderers in there. I had all kinds of people sitting around me, gangbangers. 
but because they liked my food, they would tolerate my praying. <laughs> and after a while, every now and then, one of these guys said, Mateo, can I, can I pray for somebody? Yes. That was the whole point of me doing this with them, was to get them to start talking to God. Because if that conversation starts, it's not about saying the sinner's prayer, it's about beginning a relationship. And the relationship begins with a conversation. So I always try to get guys to talk to God. And I'll tell you, some of the, one of the most impactful things about being in prison were the guys that came in from the outside. There were groups of men that came in to do retreats. Um, I'll show you a few clips of, uh, of some of those, um, some of the retreats that I was on, some of the groups that I was with. And uh, it was awesome for these guys that took time out of their schedule to come in and actually do retreats with us. It's an oasis in the middle of a dark place. But the hardest thing for me was being able to be there for my children. How do I be a father? This was the hardest thing for me in my relationship with God was how I was going to be a dad to my kids while I was in there. I remember one example. My son comes up and he's scared to death because his, his mother had filled him with information about everyone that was in there. And he was scared about, you know, all the people, violent people that he was around and he was panicking. So I asked my parents to step away from the table. And I said, God, help me, help me. How am I going to help him with this? And something came in, the Holy Spirit put something in my heart. And I said, I'm really proud of you. And he looked at me confused. He said, what do you mean you're proud of me? I said, I'm really proud of you because in spite of the fact that you're scared of all this stuff that you're talking about, you, de you demonstrated courage by coming up here to see your dad. I said, do you know what courage is? He says, is it not being afraid? I said, no, you have to have fear to have courage. Fear defines courage. Without fear, you can't, you can't demonstrate courage. Courage is the ability to overcome fear. And all of a sudden, a change happened in him. And he was happy the rest of the visit. He gets in the car on the way home, my mother told me. And <laughs> he, he, he calls his mother and says, Mom, Dad says I have courage. <laughs> Probably not the thing she wanted to hear. But it was awesome because that was how God helped me with little things like that to be the father to my children that I needed. All through this time, I had people, Christians, and my mother um, telling me that God was going to restore the years of the locus of Eden. This was a word that kept coming to me year after year from different people, and I really believe that that was the case. So where am I at now? I've been out for quite a long time, and I've rebuilt my life. I'm remarried. This is my wife now. Her name is Audrey. She's um, Goan. She was born in Africa. She has citizenship here. She's been here for a long time and she's the love of my life. And I met her at a prayer group and she's a believer. Of course, I couldn't marry someone that wasn't a believer. This guy here next to me is Serge. He was actually part of the full gospel chapter, uh, up here that I belong to. And there's my daughter. And actually that picture of my daughter, she's actually with one of the guys I was in prison with. He actually came and, and was in the wedding with me. Um, but this picture I wanted to show you because it's really important. Something happened at that wedding with my son. The couple of years before the wedding, he, I was the reason for every problem in his life. You know, as a teenager, that typically happens. And I was really struggling and asking God to heal the relationship with me and him. And he wouldn't let me hug him for two years. And I am so grateful to the photographer for grabbing this picture because there was such a healing that took place between my son and I with that moment. That was a genuine hug. You can see it in his face. And honestly, this is how God is with us. This is how God is with me. This is what it means when mercy trumps justice. God opens up his arms and he embraces us as a daddy. This is the kind of love that our Heavenly Father shows us. Soon as I got out of prison, first thing I did was look for a men's group. I got involved with the South Shore Full Gospel chapter. I started working as an audio engineer and a video engineer. This is the kind of work that I do. Just, you know, some, some stuff. But I'll tell you, God is an awesome God. And if I could leave you with anything, where I'm at now 
I'm actually the president of the Greater Boston chapter, uh, the, the, the South Shore chapter, uh, the president left. He went to uh, the Carolinas. He actually passed away from COVID. I took over the, the chapter in the beginning of 2020 and two weeks later we had a lockdown. So I had to work on building this ministry with a, with a group of guys. Dennis was also on with us tonight. He's the one with the brick wall behind him. He's the treasurer of our chapter. Um, and he has a, a ministry to prisoners writing cards. I sit on the chairman of a board uh, called BPRRS, Boston Project Rebound and Reentry Services, which helps guys getting out of prison. Part of our chapter, we set up as an emotional support group for guys coming out of prison and a spiritual support group. It's a Christian focused support group for guys online and hopefully in person when we can find a place to meet now that things are opening up. Um, but that's part of our chapter. And it's and, and the guys that are most committed to the chapter are in that group. <laughs> it's absolutely amazing. Uh, I also serve as an elder in my church and a worship leader at my church. So when, a talk, when I talk to you about God restoring the years the locusts have eaten, it is true. He will restore the years the locusts have eaten when you surrender it to him. He'll take the junk in our life. You give it to him. And what does he do? As a master artist, as a good jazz musician, will take a dissonant sound and turn it into uh, material to build something beautiful. As a carpenter, will take an ugly piece of wood and, and, and carve it and, and mold it and shape it into something beautiful. God does that with our junk. When we give up our junk to Jesus, the master artist, in his nail-pierced hands, he will recreate our lives into something beyond what we think could have been. I wouldn't change a thing that I did because it made me the man that I am today. I don't have regrets. I can't look back. Why? Because Paul said in Philippians 3, one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, I strain towards what is ahead and press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me, which calls me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Forget the past, live in the present because God is an I am and look to the future. So what do I leave you with? What I leave you with is be creative in the way that God uses you. Let God mold you and shape you the way he wants to. Don't get stuck in a comfort zone. Don't get stuck in a, in a place where you're not able to be shaped and molded. Find creative ways to share the gospel because your testimony is the power of God. It is the power of God for defeating the enemy. The word of your testimony. Find ways to get your testimony into other people's lives so that people know what Jesus did for you. One of the ways you can do that, I encourage people to get involved with ministries that minister to prisoners, either coming out or inside. Dennis has a ministry that writes cards, does writing, letter writing to prisoners. Um, th there's so much that you can do for guys on the inside, and it is a ripe field of guys that are real serious. They, they can smell a con a mile away because most of them are cons. <laughs> but don't judge them because the only difference between them and the rest of us is that they got caught. We got caught. All of us probably have done something that's worthy of going to prison for. But thank you, Jesus, that God doesn't judge us the way the world judges us. He doesn't slap us with a label. He slaps us with his label, puts his fingerprint. And as, as Julian and I were praying before this started, I prayed that God would put his fingerprint on every one of you. And I pray that God puts his fingerprint on you. I pray over every man that's here today that God, you would put your fingerprint on every man. You would put your fingerprint on Blake, on Arthur, on Doug, on John, on Freddie, on Mike, uh, on, on everybody, Lord, Reg Gregory, David, uh, Gerald. I pray, God, that your fingerprint would be on all these men, that when they're looked at, that Jesus, they wouldn't see them. Jesus, they would see you. They would see you, Jesus. They would hear your words coming out of their mouths. They would have your hands touching their lives. They would have your words of compassion, of acceptance, of love, of mercy, even of chastisement can be a form of love. But I pray it's your fingerprint, God, your fingerprint, Lord, your fingerprint in Jesus' name. Thank you so much, brothers, for letting me share. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for, for the privilege that, of being able to share my, my testimony and what you've done in my life with these men. Amen. Julian, I'll hand it over to Amen. you. Amen. 
Why well, for anyone who hasn't had a chance to accept the Lord, um, why don't we just do a short prayer? Uh, if somebody is at that place, maybe they hear the Lord is, is calling them. Um, you want to lead us in, a, in just a short prayer, brother, for anyone who hasn't given their life to Christ? Yeah, absolutely. Anybody that wants to pray, just feel free to pray after me. You can use your own words if you want to. Just, just say, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I give you my all because you gave me your all. Take my brokenness. Take the junk in my life. I lay it at the cross. And I want you, Lord, to make something beautiful of my life. You are the master artist. I give it up, God. I give up control. And I surrender to you and I accept you. I am sorry for not living the life that you wanted me to live. But I know that you give me forgiveness when I ask. Lord, forgive me. Help me to be the man that you want me to be. Amen. 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 Amen.